let me welcome you to the uh, last of the 2015-16 ISR Distinguished Lecturer Series. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Peggy Story from the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, Peggy has a, a very distinguished career and is the holder of a Canada, uh, an NSERC Canada Research Chair, which is a, a very prestigious uh, award given out to a precious few of Canadian academics. So it's a great pleasure to have Peggy here. She is uh, also going to be keynoting a uh, conference uh, later in the year here at Irvine that Debbie will tell you about later. But, uh, but for now, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Story. Okay, I'll just make sure that you can hear me okay. All right, yeah. great. So it's my pleasure to be here today and to be invited to, uh, to meet many of you. I've had a, a wonderful day hearing about your work. I'm very humbled by the awesome work that's happening here. And uh, hopefully I can share some insights today that will uh, either teach you something new that you don't know before or maybe make you think about things a little bit differently. So um, before I get into my talk, I do want to acknowledge that uh, many of the ideas in this talk are from conversations or research that my colleagues have done that are mentioned here on this slide. And uh, today I'm going to be giving this talk about big data and its role in software engineering, but also looking at how we can augment the, uh, the use and the benefits from big data with thick data, which I will uh, describe shortly what that means. Um, but before I get into the main body of my talk, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about the research that I've been doing over the past few years so that you get maybe a little bit of insight on what I've been doing and, and that will help kind of set the stage from where I'm coming from. So the research, as I said, I've been working in this area of uh, software engineering, in particular focusing on human and social aspects of software engineering, and I've been doing this work now for almost 20 years. And the first few years that I was working in this area, I was developing uh, software visualization tools. Um, and here's an example of one that I did a few years ago. Initially, we were building visualizations to help developers understand architecture and understand dependencies in the code. And then after a few years, we became more interested in visualizing collabor collaborative aspects and looking at how developers work together and looking at activity that was going on in the code. And actually, this interest in looking at the collaborative side of software development became very interesting to me which led me then to look at research that looked at the different kinds of tools that developers use to work with each other or to work with people in their community towards building software. And as you can see here, there are many uh, different tools that have come out, especially in the last few years. And many of these uh, have social features in them and bring very interesting uh, changes to the way that the, the tools are being used and how software is being developed. To give you a flavor of some of our recent studies over the past seven years or so, we've done a study on how developers use Twitter and how they use it in a very serious way to support their work. Um, the developers that do use it use Twitter to stay up to date on the latest technologies and to be informed about what's going on. And they use it to curate uh, uh, the, the network or the flow of information that's coming to them so that they can know what things they should pay attention to and which developers they should maybe network with in the community so that they can uh, get answers to the questions that they need or learn about more interesting technologies. Um, we also did a study of how developers assess each other through tools that gather data about their activity. So there's two tools in particular here that I'm referring to, CodaWall and Master Branch, which basically aggregate data about developers. So how many times they've asked questions in Stack Overflow, or how many times they've answered questions, or how many times they've done commits on GitHub. And we did a, an analysis to see how developers assess and network with each other through these tools and also how recruiters use this information through tools like CodaWall and Master Branch. We also did a study on Stack Overflow. So Stack Overflow has been around relatively few years in the history of software engineering. And we found that developers, um, in a way, were using it to create documentation for open source API. And in fact, one study that we did of three open source APIs showed very high coverage particularly at the class level, of the crowd of developers out there answering questions about uh, the APIs on, on Stack Overflow and, in effect, producing documentation for each other. Uh, more recently, I've had a student look at how developers share tacit knowledge through YouTube. So a lot of knowledge about software development <coughs> is is knowledge that's very hard to externalize or very hard to write down, but developers are using the video channel of YouTube to share information that would be hard to articulate 
through written means. And other developers watch these videos uh, to learn about how to use APIs or to learn about how to manage security issues and so on in the code. And uh, we're also looking at uh, GitHub and how developers coordinate code changes, how they, what factors um, really encourage them to commit their code to open source projects or to public projects, and what, which factors are um, used by the owners of the projects to decide which code should actually go into the project. So this is just a very 30,000 foot view of some of the studies that we've been doing over the last few years to understand the role of these more social tools in development activities. Um, and you'll notice that um, what I just shared with you, it's a very tool-centric perspective. So each of these studies, we came up trying to understand what is happening in software engineering from looking at the tool, through looking at activity through the tool itself. And this caused us to sort of take a step back and say, well, what, what is really going on here? If we take a, a, deep, a big step back from the way that developers are working, can we somehow get an understanding of the, the landscape of tools that they're using and the kinds of activities that they are using these tools for? And it, this, is, this shows a timeline of how tools have developed over time. And if we go back in time, we can see that the tools that developers were using were mainly um, non-digital. And then these then became uh, digital through IDEs and through tools like Visual Age and, and the Usenet tool. And then eventually, they have morphed into tools that are more communication and social uh, features in them. And this axis here uh, describes tools that are used to exchange information that is tacit or information that is exchanged person to person. This dimension here describes tools that help developers externalize their knowledge, whether it's in an IDE. Um, and this, this dimension here refers to the externalization of knowledge that is in community resources, such as through books or through Stack Overflow or through Google Groups. And then finally, this dimension here refers to a meta level almost about knowledge about the networks of developers and how developers are connected to one another and who to connect and which, which communities they belong to. So we wanted to understand, well, how are developers using this constellation of tools and what are they using them for? And so we've been surveying developers over the past three years and we have over two and a half thousand responses to the survey where we're trying to understand what are the different tools and channels that the developers are using and what kinds of activities do they care about and which tools are being used to support these activities. And this gives just a, a visualization of the breadth of the different kinds of tools that are being used, as well as the different kinds of activities that, they're, that are, they are being supported through these tools. And it's important to emphasize that developers don't just care about writing code. That's just one small part of their job. They spend a lot of time caring about um, what they're learning and getting answers to questions. Okay? And they use many different tools to do that. So web search, of course, which may bring them to Q&A sites such as Stack Overflow <coughs> and then also through code hosting. They learn a lot through using tools like GitHub and looking at other projects. Um, they also care a lot about connecting, as I mentioned earlier, to other developers. And they may connect to developers through face-to-face -face channels, even when they're apart in the world. They may use things like Skype or Google Groups. Um, and they also connect through tools like microblogging, so through Twitter, and also, again, through code hosting sites, such as GitHub. And then finally, through coordination, they again use face-to-face -face and, and private discussions, but they use coast hosting again to support coordination, as well as using special uh, coordination tools for that. So what we found from doing these studies is that we noticed that there is this participatory development culture occurring in software engineering. And I'm borrowing here some concepts from Jenkins, who studied a participatory learning culture in educational uh, space. And this participatory culture can be identified by the, this uh, notion of a social creation and sharing of knowledge and content in that area with informal mentorship happening. So experts mentor novices, and novices expect to be mentored, as well as awareness that the contributions that they're making really matter to others and that others care and that they want to they wanna share those contributions with each other. And some of you may be thinking, well, isn't this just open source? This is what's been happening in open source for a long time. It did start in open source, but it's not just open source. We're now seeing developers that are working for companies sharing knowledge through things like Twitter and through Stack Overflow and through YouTube even, uh, because they care about the community and they care about sharing that knowledge. So we've been struggling somewhat to study this participatory culture, which is a very complex kind of setting. And on the one hand, we've been looking at tools, as I showed you at the beginning, 
um, or we've done surveys with actors, but that gives a quite an impoverished view when you just look at this phenomena through one or two particular kind of perspectives. So what we're struggling with, I suppose, a little bit now is trying to understand how do we gain a view of this entire landscape of software engineering because we care not just about the tools that they use or the artifacts that they create or the companies that they belong to, but we also care about the practices and the activities that are fostered by the different tools and by the different uh, artifacts that they're creating. So I just wanted to, to put this here, I may refer back to this later on, in terms of how do you broach this complex space and how how do you go about studying what's going on through these different means? So to the talk today, so to the main part of my talk, I just want to um, motivate it a little bit with uh, sharing with you that the major challenges, I think we're all aware of these, that we have in facing in software engineering. So on the one hand, we're trying to develop code maybe in, in a manner that's faster and cheaper and we're trying to develop systems that have more features and we're also caring about security at the same time. Um, but we're also competing with the needs of developers. So yes, they care about how productive they are in writing code, but many of them also care about the skills that they have. So they're not as um, you know, wedded to the companies that they're working for anymore. They care a lot about having the, the skills that are going to get them um, maybe a different job tomorrow or maybe get them working on more interesting projects in the future. So skills are really important to them and being happy is really important and being connected to other developers. These are things that developers really care about and they go to a lot of effort to make sure that they're, they, they feel, these, uh, feel empowered. And then organizations, on the other hand, you know, may have different uh, concerns. They may be more concerned with the, the uh, productivity of the developers in terms of uh, writing code, but they also care about retaining developers in their community or in their organization and maybe in bringing in new uh, people as well to bring in innovation into their projects. So these concerns tend to compete with one another and anytime we make a change, maybe in the tools that developers are using or make a change in the process, we're somehow adjusting these, uh, these different concerns and the ones that we're paying attention to. So a lot of researchers and I would even say a lot of pr practitioners believe the answers to some of these concerns that I just raised um, may lay in big data that we have available now to uh, software engineering researchers and also to practitioners as well. And so the tools that are being used create all of this trace data, even tools like Twitter and Stack Overflow or GitHub, they, they contain very rich resources of what's actually happening in the code. And a lot of uh, engineers, as I said, researchers and practitioners are looking to finding answers to some of these uh, challenges that they're faced through analyzing this data. But I wanted to share with you that sometimes if we focus too much on the data or, or too much on the machinery that we have, that big things, things can go wrong. So I'm not sure if anybody else is a sailor here, uh, because you live near Newport, maybe you are, but I like to, uh, I like to sail. And uh, most of my friends, when they've hit uh, rocks on their boats, they, it turns out that they were turn focusing on their GPS at the time that they hit the rock, which, by the way, was visible if they just looked ahead of their boat. Um, and this is a very common thing that occurs, that when you have a lot of technology available to you, that you focus on the technology and you sort of forget that there's, oh, there's an island right there that you should be looking at. So um, this is sort of the theme of my talk. Um, so if you have to leave, you, you've got the main point. <laughs> I thought I'd get it out early because it's Friday afternoon. Um, so the main theme of my talk is that, yes, big data can bring a lot of you know, richness and a lot of uh, answers and a lot of power to the problems that we have. But at the same time, we need to not get blinded by that data and that there are risks from using it and that we need to make sure that we're not missing some really big things if we focus too much on that data. Um, so what is thick data? I had thick data in the title. And I've had several people say, what, what the heck is thick data? <laughs> so I'll give you a glimpse and then I'll describe it a bit more later on. So thick data is a term that's used often in the social sciences, and in particularly uh, in methods such as ethnography, where you're collecting these very rich, uh, thick descriptions from human beings about what's going on. And this is just one of my uh, favorite examples from ethnography, where you want to understand really what's going on in a skateboarding park. Anybody here skateboard? 
or have kids that do, right? So there's lots of sort of nuances there that you would only get by being there, right? I'm sure that you agree. And there's parts to you know how it works and the language that's used that you would only get from actually participating um, in that environment. And I have to say that when I first started uh, studying Twitter, and I wasn't using Twitter, I didn't really understand the data because I wasn't using it and I didn't understand the culture and the lingo. So I had to get embedded uh, into using it to be able to make sense of the data. So having this thick data that really brings important insights into the thing that you're studying is really important, and that's what I want to focus on here. So as an outline of my talk, um, I want to give a little bit of history of this field of software analytics, which is a relatively new uh, term, software analytics, that's been used in software engineering research and in, and in practice, but it's had actually a long history. So I want to give you a little bit of insight into the history behind software analytics. I'm then going to talk about just some of the risks that I think we face if we focus too much on software analytics and don't think about what else is out there beyond the big data that we're looking at. And then I want to close with giving perhaps some insights into the future of where and how we could uh, blend thick data with big data. And throughout, I'll try to reference both researchers and practitioners. So let me start with uh, looking at this history of software analytics. So the, I guess the, the history of software analytics really goes back to um, the introduction of thinking about metrics in software engineering. And this goes back actually to the very first days of when we had uh, code and when we, when we had programs that we needed to care about. And um, the dawn of this actually is often credited with this quote by Morris Wilkes. Um, in 1949, where he had the realization that the rest of his life, so he was a, a programmer, was probably going to be spent finding errors in his programs. So he had this realization that errors in the code were just you know, a matter of, of life that he was going to have to deal with. And so from that kind of observation came this, uh, the introduction of metrics to be able to describe what's going on in the programs, you know, how, many, how many bugs do we have, if we change how we write the code, are we going to have fewer bugs? and so on, and that it, was, it would be important to measure what's going on, because if you don't measure what's going on, then you can't manage it. So DeMarco is sort of credited with this quote, but of course, Kelvin has made other similar quotes in other areas of science. And why use metrics? Well, they're used for many different reasons. Maybe it's to discover some facts about the world, or maybe it's to steer our actions or modify our behavior towards more positive behaviors, which will improve how we go about writing the code or working with others. And the metrics can be used by individuals or teams or organizations or maybe managers or potentially even external organizations. So there are many audience for using these different metrics. Here's some examples of, of metrics. There are many, okay, many, many examples of metrics and many ways of uh, describing them and categorizing them. So some are related to the product, so some you know, lines of code or complexity measures or me measures that talk about the object-oriented nature of the code, or maybe there's a, a metric for describing the number of defects or known defects in the code. Other metrics are more focused on the process, so how, how well it's tested, how many code reviews are being done, or what, what is the coverage of the, the code that is being reviewed. Um, perhaps also agile practices, so number of sprints that have occurred, occurred or maybe burn down rate. Um, and then there are other metrics that focus uh, more on the developer, so the productivity of the developer. And sometimes uh, lines of code is used for that, sometimes the number of commits that they make to a repository, or sometimes the, uh, the mean time to repairing the defects that they found. And other developer metrics are things like the number of followers, right? So if a, a developer is seen as a rock star in the community, that developer would have many followers and, and potentially is worth you know, following too. Maybe they know some things that I need to learn. We're also starting to see the use of biometrics uh, for uh, gathering data about developers. And of course, there are also metrics in terms of estimation and looking at cost and predicting the cost uh, of projects. So are, have metrics been successful? Well, if we look at the research side um, and you look at the number of papers and conferences, and those of us that have been around for a while will have seen many of these and reviewed many of these papers, it's been a huge success, right? There's a big uh, successful community around metrics. And if we look at industry, and the same thing, we see a widespread use of metrics in industry, in small companies and in large companies, and there have been some uh, pretty good papers that have described case studies of how these metrics have been used in organizations. 
And in fact, you know, even years ago, we saw these metrics being integrated in CASE tools. So CASE stands for Computer Aided Software Engineering, if, if you're not familiar with that term. And more recently with uh, modern development tools, we see uh, metrics being used in those as well. Some of the challenges um, with metrics initially was that a lot of them tended to focus on the product rather than on the process. And that has shifted over the last few years. And initially, too, the metrics weren't used uh, in a very effective manner. Um, but that has changed, too, since Basili et al. really called for um, to identifying what is the goal behind using the metrics and what are the questions that they're trying to answer. So just looking at one of these metrics that's still widely used uh, even today, um, it's lines of code. And why is it used uh, so much? Well, it's easy to calculate. Um, it's easy to understand. You know, you know, people get it, and it's easy to visualize. And it's been used to be uh, descriptive of the product as well as, uh, as a surrogate measure for uh, developer productivity. And it also correlates uh, quite highly with uh, complexity measures and also with the number of defects in the code. Um, but measuring lines of code has been criticized, of course, uh, quite widely. And I really like this quote, measuring program progress by lines of code is like measuring aircraft building progress <coughs> by weight. And you know, it's similar to saying that you know, a tricycle, you know, number of lines of code to, to you know, implement something like on a bike versus implement something on a space shuttle is equivalent. They're not. The complexity is very different. Um, so lines of code these days is, is really considered to be quite a, a weak metric, even though you still use, see it being used. <coughs> so the use of metrics um, has, and how they're applied has evolved and evolved sort of about the mid-2000s in how they were used in, in a community called Mining Software Repositories. And the Mining Software Repository conference really took off in the mid-2000s. Uh, the first one was 2004. And it came about because of these, the wide availability of repositories that capture trace data from developers. So we now had data about every version of the code and data about every line of code that developers changed, okay? as well as a lot of data about testing and, and about deployment as well. And many of these repositories were open source, so researchers like myself who before this struggled to get data and understand what developers were doing, now had access to these uh, rich repositories which we could analyze and use to bring insights into what is going on in software engineering. And um, this is a quote that I've heard several times and I've even seen it in papers. We have all this data, the problem is what to do with it. And uh, while I push back a little bit on that, I don't know that the problem is what to do with the data. The problem is really what we're trying to solve, right, with the data. Um, but nevertheless, uh, many of us in research were struggling with, we have this data, can we use it in a good way to bring insights to software engineering? And as I mentioned, we have uh, this rich uh, variety of data that we had in these repositories at the program level, but also at the user level. Uh, so companies are being swamped with data about their users and even have access to you know, surveys that they might answer online or access to data on A-B testing, as well as stuff that they might post on Twitter and blogs. And we have access to a lot of, as I said, the development data, but not just development tools, but also about the communication between developers that they do through tools like Twitter and through Stack Overflow as well. So lots and lots of data that we have at our fingertips. And in terms of the techniques, there are many rich techniques that are being brought in from other areas of science and machine learning and AI, and using these techniques to analyze this data that we have in software engineering to see, you know, how can we use this to bring improvements in some way. And if you're interested in these techniques, you can look at many years of the Mining Software Repositories Conference to get a list of these techniques. And the benefits from mining this trust data, uh, trace data is that we're not, um, when we use this, we're not interfering with the developers. So they're not <coughs> reacting to us in any way because they're just doing what they do all the time, what they do naturally. So the data is in some ways um, perhaps uh, representing what they do in, in their natural environment. And the records are being made by the participants. So us as researchers, having access to this data, it's relatively easy to collect, right? Because we're not going to a lot of effort in, in creating the data. The developers are doing that. We're just going along and sort of plucking all of this data out of the repositories and then using it to, to uh, support our research. <coughs> 
Um, and so looking at one example of the, the kinds of studies that are done um, in the mining software repositories community, a lot of the papers that you'll see in that conference um, are on looking at defects. And in fact, DiMarco, um, after looking at how metrics were used in software engineering for many years, uh, concluded in 1997 that the only metric wor worth counting is defects. I don't agree with him, but that was uh, you know, one of the things that he, he mentioned in 97. So I use that as the example here. And why do we care about mining and measuring information about bugs? Well, if you're a developer, you may care yourself about how many bugs you're putting into your code, or are you improving um, if you use one language, say, over another language? Uh, managers may care in terms of understanding the status of the product. And you may even want to look at your, your code base or look at your process and try to use this information in some way to predict the reliability of your code. Okay? If you do you know, a certain kind of activity, is that going to make your, your code more reliable? And so uh, bug prediction is, is one of the hot topics in the mining software repository community. And there are many models that uh, predict bugs. And some of these actually show quite a bit of promise. Um, particularly when they're applied to specific projects or applied in specific uh, companies. And they use things like ownership. So if you have a lot of different developers uh, making changes to the same part of the code, that code may not be as reliable as other code. So we've had some studies that show that. Or if the code is being changed frequently, or if the code is somehow tangled and has dependencies with other code in the system, those parts of the code um, are more likely to have defects in the future and should be examined more closely right now in the present. But what, uh, unfortunately, what's happened is that we're seeing poor replication of many of these results across organizations. In fact, we see sometimes poor replication even within an organization. So looking at different projects within the same organization, we see that the models that are being developed don't replicate well. So clearly, there's a lot more going on uh, that is not being captured right, by these models in order to predict the reliability. And they've also been uh, criticized because um, some uh, practitioners say, well, thanks for giving me that information about which parts of my code were buggy, but, you know, actually I knew that already. I knew that these were the modules that were buggy and your metrics don't really help me. You're just telling me what I already know. So there was some criticism um, about this, and, and actually there's a lovely paper, if you're interested in this, by Aranda et al., um, where they talk about the secret life of bugs and what goes on about bugs that you can't see in the repositories, you can't see from the trace data. And they talk and they follow basically the life of bug and show all of the activity that occurs outside of the tool and outside of the trace data that's uh, there to be um, studied. And I forgot to mention, I have quite a few references in my slides. I have uh, a few slides of references at the end and I will make my slides available if anybody wants them. Um, so that was, so we started off with metrics, right? So focus in the research area and an industry on measurements. And then this evolved into techniques uh, for, for applying those measurements to these repositories that we had available. So that was kind of the mining software repository uh, era, if you like, in this kind of research. The conference is still going, mining software repositories. But lately it's been, uh, this area of work is now being called software analytics. It's shifting from the metrics to the techniques to software analytics. And this is a, a table from uh, chapter one from a book on data science. Again, I have a, a, a reference at the end, where they give five different definitions, um, or five different researchers give definitions of what software analytics is about. And they, they all share basically the same thing, that these uh, techniques are about being um, actionable and, an, uh, and about finding insights from the repositories using these metrics that bring insights that can be in some way actionable. So it's really been this, this evolution. And uh, the area of software analytics and, in fact, mining software repositories has been um, really motivated a lot by the data science movement in general, which is being used, data science is used in many other areas of science and in economics and things like cli climate science from, and so on. And data science uh, is seen as you know, a hot, hot area to work in, a hot opportunity uh, for people to, to uh, gain skills in this area. And what are the skills? So the skills here are um, having good hacking skills, so being able to do computation in some way, 
um, having good uh, background in math and statistics, and also having um, expertise in the domain that you're studying. So bringing these three skills together is what uh, brings uh, uh, the data science uh, skills together in, in terms of uh, applying these problems. So those, uh, the data science skills have been brought into the area of software analytics, and the goals in software analytics are similar to the goals before, although they're, they're phrased in a way that's more actionable. So it, we're trying to improve the quality of the software, we're trying to improve the experience of the users, and we're trying to improve the productivity of the developers through the software analytics techniques. And the data science spectrum that's been applied um, in software analytics uh, can be viewed this way. Again, there's more details in this book here. Um, so on the one hand, you can be looking at data that has comes from the past, so previous uh, activities that the developers have done. And you can use that data to explore trends or to analyze what's going on or to maybe even sort of do a retrospective experiment. Or from the present, where you want your analysis from the analytics to maybe give you an alert that something is going on right now that you should pay attention to. Um, or you may use these techniques for the future, for predicting something that's going to happen or for simulating, if you try different techniques, uh, what's going to happen in the future. So a pretty rich spectrum of, uh, of problems that you can apply in software analytics. And automation, I mean the goal of, of software analytics is really to increase the amount of automation that's used in software engineering. And this is becoming more and more important, particularly if you look at um, big, large open source projects or an industry where the projects there um, rely on thousands of developers working together and committing code that ultimately is going to be part of the same product, say for example Windows. Um, and that when you're scaling your project to thousands of de developers, that the, the role of automation becomes absolutely critical in knowing what's going on and being alerted of you know, trends that are coming or issues that are coming within that, within that uh, space. And the goal of using this uh, automation is to optimize the competing concerns of quality, time, and the resources that are being used. Um, data scientists are increasingly uh, be, uh, becoming a role and being hired in these large companies such as uh, Google and Apple and, and Microsoft. And these data science basically manage and measure the impact of the role of software analytics and of automation in the, in the, in the uh, projects that are happening in the company. And there's a good, uh, a, a very nice paper coming out in ICSI this year, which actually did an analysis and a study of data scientists and the roles of data scientists in, in uh, Microsoft. So you can look at that and get an insight into how data science are playing uh, a role here. But it's not just big companies. Small companies, I've worked with uh, one small company uh, that uh, is close by where I live, where they also have a data science de scientist, and they're trying to understand which part of their website their users are going to and how they can improve um, how users come back to their website and use their, their tool over time. And there are even some companies that deliver analytics as a service. So this is uh, actually one small a company that grew out of researchers where they create analytics uh, for other companies. So they analyze the source code and then deliver um, through a web app some visualizations to the company so that they can get insights on the code that they have and, and what's going on. Actually, a lot of the techniques that they're using are based on pretty simple metrics, but nevertheless, companies are finding them useful. Um, so one question I want to ask here in terms of software analytics and looking at the use of these metrics and techniques in action is uh, that several companies have tried to get, gain an understanding if increasing the way or the breadth of how you test your code is going to increase reliability. And uh, actually several people have thought that it should, right? If you test more of your code, surely the reliability of the code would go up. But it turns out that in some cases that is not the case. Um, that if you spend more of your resources testing all of your code, reliability actually may go down and more bugs may appear. And so this uh, actually happened at Microsoft and is described in a paper by Marcus et al. where um, what they found was that they were spending a lot of time testing the simple code rather than testing the code that is more likely to have um, bugs. Um, so that's just my overview, I guess, of the history of software analytics. I've gone from metrics through to mining, software repositories, and then to software analytics. And now I want to talk and share with you some of the risks about software analytics. 
And these risks are um, basically a collection of different things that I've heard other people say, and there are other papers that go into some of these and maybe go into others. Um, but I feel that these are the sort of the five, the five major ones that we need to pay attention to. And, and before I go into these, I should also emphasize that I'm not against using big data or algorithms um, or analytics uh, for in software engineering. I think that it's got a lot of benefit, but I think that we need to go into it with our eyes open and be careful that we're not just blindly applying these techniques. So the first one has to do with the trustworthiness of the data that we're analyzing. So I've mentioned that we have these rich repositories with all this data out there that we can use, but we need to really question if the data that we're looking at really represents the phenomenon that we're trying to measure. So I talked about that with lines of code and productivity, right? Or maybe the number of commits that developers make. Is that a good um, measure of their productivity? Probably not. Um, and also the completeness of the data. So the data is, that is available out there is often missing things, okay? Missing the things that, the effort, right, that people go to behind the scenes, or maybe missing effort on the execution of the program that you're not seeing from the tra traces. And we're also seeing inaccuracies in profiles and in what people are saying in their, uh, you know, online, say, opinions about things. And a lot of the techniques that we're using are treating humans or treating developers and users as if they're rational, right? We're sort of making this assumption that um, developers want to do things that are going to be good for their organization, for the overall benefit of the organization. But in fact, a lot of people do things because of uh, motivations that we may not even be aware of, right? Sort of selfish uh, reasons even. Maybe even they're competing with other people and you can't see that from just looking at the data. This paper from uh, Mining Software Repositories in 2014 actually talks about some of these perils um, from using the data and from analyzing the data. And I think it's a pretty important paper because there's so much research going on right now in the community on using uh, the GitHub repository. And they just bring you know, some of the issues. So for example, you can rewrite history in GitHub. So you can squash uh, commits. And uh, so that you think that you're seeing what actually occurred, but you can actually rewrite the history and you, you lose some of the history of what ha happened there. And a lot, of course, happens outside of GitHub, right, that you're not seeing there. The second one I want to talk about is the trustworthiness of the results. And the first one um, is researcher bias. And researcher bias applies in any method you use. Uh, of course, but I want to bring attention to it here, and I, and I refer you to a paper by Shepard et al. that appeared in TSC in 2014, where they uh, looked at, they did a meta-analysis of, uh, so I think, 24 studies that looked at defect, defect prediction, and they modeled um, the, the, the different techniques and how they were used, and what they found out was that the particular um, out, uh, classification that they were used had a very small impact on the performance of the defect prediction technique, but what had a bigger impact was actually the research group that was using the techniques. So this sort of brings to mind you know, that researcher bias can play you know, a really big role in how these things are used. Um, and there's also uh, some confusion uh, with uh, correlation with cause and effect, and also seeing small effects from big data. And of course, you know, we've probably all seen articles and heard of stories about this. I like the one by Marcus et al., where they studied data from the U.S. and saw that if they, that, so they had a lot of data, and they, they found a correlation between the murder rate in the U.S. and the choice of web browser that was being used at the time, right? You probably saw that one. There was a New York Times article about it that I thought was pretty funny. But that's the kind of thing that we have this opportunity now in software, that we have this big data, and we have this ability to see these small effects and maybe you know, be misled by it. Inappropriately generalizing the results from one setting to another, we see this happening. And sometimes the conclusions that we get from our data is not stable. And I talked about this already in, in terms of replication, but we're also seeing this even in the same project. So other groups try to take the techniques and try to produce the same results, and they can't do it. They're not able to replicate even within the same project. So I just uh, wanted to put this quote up there because I like it. So, I mean, we know that all models are you know, an abstraction, right? That, that our choice of what we measure in the model you know, it really is, is our choice, right, based on what we know. But some of them are useful. So even though there are limits in how they can be used, we just need to keep our eyes open and really focus on what are the variables in this model and what are the right variables. And sometimes we forget about that, right? Once we have the model, we just become focused on it and narrow. Uh, our vision is narrowed because of it.
Okay, the third one I want to talk about, um, and this one is, is not talked about that much, at least in software engineering so far, and that is some of the ethical issues. So, um, you know, some, when, if I'm a developer and I'm committing code to projects, or say I'm a student, I can't afford my own private repositories on GitHub, and I'm uh, committing code to a project that I'm doing for my course, and I'm also committing code for an open source project, I don't really intend that to be public, right? I don't really intend for other people to analyze it and to quote me, right, in a paper. And yet, because of the use of these tools out there, that's what's happening, right? These spaces are you know, in a sense public, but they're not really being intended to be used by that by many of their users. And so what we're also seeing is now having the ability to do surveillance at the level of the individual. So, um, you know, through this trace data, we can actually be watching what a developer did yesterday. You know, how many commits did they do to GitHub? What time did they go to bed last night? You know, what were they tweeting about? Uh, what were they, you know, asking questions about on Stack Overflow? So we're really able to kind of really get a lot of fine-grained uh, data about individuals, both in the open source space, but also in companies, and should we be, right? Um, and if, if your manager makes an assessment about you, about how productive you are, because they see you in work every day, um, you kind of know where their biases are coming from. But if they're just using an algorithm and analyzing your data, and you don't understand the algorithm, then there are sort of more, more uh, problems with the biases, right, that come from the use of the algorithms that you don't even understand. So it's sort of the message here is that, you know, the bias that you understand is better than the bias that you don't, right? And I'm sure many of you heard about the infamous Facebook study, right, where they manipulated uh, the emotions um, or manipulated the feed of people. Uh, they did this, I think, over a week uh, period. And uh, they changed people's posts so that they would either be more positive or less positive, so negative, and then they watched to see if the, the posts had an impact on their own posts, right, whether it made them happier or sadder, basically. Um, and what they found was actually it did make them a little bit unhappy. Um, and there was a big outcry about this because of the ethics uh, to do with that. But actually the effects were pretty small. So this was another case of big data and a small effect. <laughs> but one of the good things that came, I think, out of this study was that there is generally a call now to develop a, a framework for ethics around using this kind of data. So hopefully that will come and it's discussed in this article. And then the fourth risk is uh, thinking about the unexpected consequences. So I'm doing actually quite a bit of research myself on looking at gender and the impact of some of these features like gamification on gender. Um, but we need to be careful that if we're sort of reporting that females are treated unfairly in open source or that there's not very many females, maybe we scare away even more. And we have the reverse effect, right, of what we're trying to do. And because of the gamification elements in many of these environments too, you see people trying to gamify these things and changing their behavior, not in the way that you really intended. And in companies, if they're using incentives, there needs to be care that the incentives that they're using may be actually resulting in behavior that they were trying to avoid in the first place. And we saw this when we did our analysis of the assessing and watching developer data that I talked about. So these show the, the dashboards <coughs> of developer activity. And we see it in particular with the uh, contributing graphs that are used on GitHub. And there's been actually really uh, fascinating discussion on GitHub going on about this. Um, called contributing graphs considered harmful because people are reading this and you know assuming that this really is a good representation right of how active you were in you know the last week of your life even though this just shows your public activity and it doesn't sh say a lot about the kinds of commits or the nature of the things that you were doing through GitHub. Um, and Microsoft, uh, Begel and uh, Zimmerman at uh, Microsoft did a, a study of what kind of questions developers wanted answered uh, from data scientists. And they also asked about what are the most unwise questions. And most of these unwise questions that they came up with were actually about sort of measuring employee productivity. And then the fifth risk um, is that I think big data uh, can't answer big questions, at least today. Maybe this will change. Um, so if you're in London and you're um, rented a car there and you want to find your way around, um, you might, would you be more likely to trust Google Maps and giving you directions or would you trust a cabbie that lives in London, right? Which would you choose? Mr. B. Yes, that's what anybody would notice. Well, you might trust the cabbie, but not if it looks like Mr. B. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's 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 unclear, right? Uh, if you were using Waze that brings in data from the crowd, maybe you would you know use that as well. However, if you're sick and you know you've got access to lots of data about you know the best treatment, 
uh, for a disease, are you going to tr trust the data or are you going to trust the physician? Well, actually, probably what you'd prefer is to trust a physician that uses the data, right? You want them to use both. And so really, you need access to the big data and the algorithms as well as the human expertise. Both really matter. So what are examples of big questions in software engineering? So here's just some that I came up with, and I'm sure you all have your own favorite uh, examples. So um, what is a good architecture to solve problem X? This is something that we struggle with, right? Um, and you're not going to get this from big data, at least not today, right, with the, with the uh, algorithms we have today. What makes a really awesome programmer, right? Um, is it their ability to memorize an API, or is it how they use Google, or is it how they network, right, the people that they know? Um, how do you build a great development team? So Google actually has been asking this question for quite a while, and I have a link at the end to an article that describes how they used ethnography to really study what makes a really good development team. Again, they couldn't get it from big data. Um, how is pro program knowledge distributed? So now our asks, you know, talks about this and notices that when a company buys another company, that they also acquire the developers, right? They can't just get all the knowledge from the tools. What is an ideal software engineering process? Well, it turns out that all the big companies, they don't know. They all do different things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So this is still an open question and still something we're not going to get answered from big data. And what tools, practices support a participatory development process? So this is something we're trying to get a hold on and we're needing to use different kinds of data to bring insights into this. So those are the five risks so that I went through. And of course there are other papers and I have some in my references that talk about the others. <coughs> so for the last couple of minutes I'll just talk about, well, where do we go forward? So, um, so data scientists, as I mentioned, is this new ro role in software engineering, and often they will, uh, they, they love data, right, and they love patterns. This is what they love to do, right? So they tend to be a bit focused on the data and not as uh, focused on what is the problem that needs to be solved. And even uh, John Snow, who's often given as an example of the first, you know, data scientist or example of, you know, using data, um, it's... He, he came up with a visualization of uh, the pump that was causing the spread of cholera in London. Um, at the time, the theory was that cholera was being spread through air. Um, he didn't start with the data and then visualize it and then come up with a theory. Actually, he started by talking to people. Okay? And then from talking to people, he came up with a theory. And then he used data and the visualization to, to convince others that the problem was actually with the pump. And so going back to this, these skills of what the data scientists should have, I'm just putting forward there that we need a bit more than just these three things. We need more than knowledge of statistics, more than just hacking skills, and more than just domain knowledge, that we need to know how to get data from people and from the social setting that these kinds of activities uh, go in. And so again, what is thick data? So I just give you a little glimpse at the beginning. It can be many different things. So I'm not trying to say it's quantitative data versus qualitative data. It's not about that. It's really <coughs> about looking at the, the data that is, tr the trace data that's left behind versus researchers or social scientists that go out there and try to collect data from people and collect data from the social setting. And so they'll, rich, thick data can give us explanations about things that you may not see in the trace data. They'll give us insights into motivations and insights into recommendations. What are the best way to do testing or to do code review? Um, they'll give us insights into variables for a model that we may not have you know, thought about and they'll give us perhaps you know, more questions rather than answers. And sometimes it's the questions that are important rather than the answers. And of course there are limitations right, in this kind of data too, but if we use big data and thick data, we can offset the limitations that you get from both of these techniques. And I just wanted to offer, this is uh, one approach. Anybody heard of ethno mining? Okay, didn't think so. It's not, it's not widely written about out there, but it's a, a new approach that social scientists are talking about which really combines the ethos of um, ethnography interleaved with using data mining. So this is not just the traditional mixed methods where you do a survey and then you go look at the data and then maybe you interview a couple of people. That's not what I'm talking about here. This is a, a, a much uh, more rigorous approach and an interleaving of the two approaches. So you use the data to inform what you're doing and then you know maybe it's interviews and then from the interviews you go back to the data and you switch backwards and forwards between the two of them. And the goal is to support storytelling, you know, to support the numbers that you have out, uh, get out of it, and to leverage visualization within the tight loops of eliciting and reporting the results that you're getting from both sides. 
Um, I'll give an example of how we've used visualization in one of the studies that we've done. We've actually done this in several, where we mine the repositories and we pull out data and we pull out themes from the data that's left behind. So in this case, we were looking at how developers were tagging work items in a development environment. And we then visualized uh, that data for ourselves just to look at it. And we looked at this and we thought, oh, Polish, that's probably something to do with globalization. And then we created a, a, an interactive visualization, um, not, not as an end to a means, but we actually created this so we could go to the developers and use this visualization in interviews with the developers and say, you know, what, what does this tag refer to and why, why did you suddenly you know, start switching and talking about or tagging your work items with this other item? And this actually was extremely useful. And we were able to pull out results from the developers by using this visualization of the, thick, uh, of the big data. And Polish, by the way, wasn't Polish. It was Polish, yeah. duh, <laughs> UI, right? Polishing the UI. Um, so there are many research challenges ahead, even with you know, using big data and thick data. And I guess the point of my talk is to try to encourage people to think of those two things. Um, even if you look at social sciences, there are two camps. There is the one camp that tends to use quantitative research methods and the other camp that use uh, more qualitative. And if you look at their citation references, you see you know, that they're, they're not really talking to each other. And so what I'm really calling for is that we have more integration of those two approaches and that they you know, work together, bring the benefits of both. And this is particularly important because we're working in this rapid uh, pace of change right now. You know, the way that software engineering is being done and the role of automation is just increasing. And one of the things that we have found is that when we do our surveys, we ask you know, developers, which tools are they using? And then we get these responses from, you know, we always have the other box, right? And in the other box, they tell us about these new tools that we hadn't even heard about. And we're like, oh, what? <laughs> it's changed, right? The landscape has changed before we've even deployed our survey. We learned about Slack that way, by the way. And actually, our current research is looking at Slack. And, uh, and mostly because Slack ha has this feature of bots in it, where you can program these bots to do the analytics for the developers. And these bots bring the analytics into the conversation space with the developers. So Slack is uh, sort of like the IRC. It's this uh, chatting environment that developers are just, the adoption of it is just going like this. It's off the charts. And you know, this, I love this uh, quote from the future is Kevin Kelly, you'll be paid in the future based on how well you work with robots. So developers, you know, the developers of the future, we used to say that developer skill was really kind of distinguished by how well they could Google. But I think as we look into the future, probably developer skill will be how well they can work with the robots that do the analytics for them. So the key takeaway here is that as researchers and as practitioners, that we need to caution that the big data that we're using and the analytics techniques that we're using need thick data, right? That we need to not just uh, blindly use the data that we have. And that maybe the future of software analytics and you know, somehow we need to come up with techniques that allow us to bring more of this thick data in so that we can analyze that data in, in a more sort of mindful way. So with that, I'll close and leave a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> kind of rushed at the end. I hope that was okay. So any questions or comments? Yes. Um, very interesting <coughs> talk first, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, but with regard to your, your observation about, you know, big data, thick data, qualitative, quantitative, uh, what if it's the case that that's in fact the optimal that is, the fact that they're separate Ooh. is more powerful than notions of bridging them, and bridging yeah. them may give you a saddle point rather than a yeah. peak. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, a great philosophical question that you have stumped me with. Um, that wasn't my point. I was yeah. just trying to <laughs> No, no, I, I love it. <laughs> uh, because that is not something that I even uh, thought about. But. Yeah, may maybe that's true, and maybe we need to be mindful of that, right, as we go forward, that, um, that keeping them separate is the way to go, and that they shouldn't be combined. Um, yeah, good, good point. Something to keep our eye out Yeah, for. I'm not necessarily advocating Yeah, no, 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 it's an interesting point. Yeah, and I would, I would definitely say that there could be some settings where that's the case, right, where that you should separate them. But I, I think um, 
in the age that we live in right now. So a lot of people, there's this book called The Second Machine Age, I don't know if anybody's read it, um, or you know, has background in machine lear learning. So the Industrial Revolution was the first mach machine age, and now the use of machine learning and AI is now the second machine age, and we now have computers, right, that beat uh, other, uh, any world expert humans, right, at, ch at chess. But actually, if you take the, uh, the expert in chess and you give them you know, an even simple computer, and a good process that they will be even the best expert computer. So I, I sort of believe that you know bringing analytics and bringing and humans together is is the way to go in terms of uh, the world as we move forward. And I think as researchers and practitioners trying to understand software engineering, that the better answers lie in bringing those two things together. But I don't have any evidence for that. <laughs> but that's just what I feel is that it's those two things together that we're going to get you know, more results from. Yeah? So, I mean, it goes both ways, right? Yeah. Sometimes you, you can get also stuck in believing the, the observations of thick data, and yes. sometimes you get drawn into actually things that are false. Yes, absolutely. And you, and you see the contradictions when you do a very a large quantitative yes. analysis, right? Yes, absolutely, so yeah. Absolutely. And I, I was trying to get that across, but I realized I was sort of like, you know, the I was sort of swinging the pendulum a little bit over this way to say, hey, we need to look at more thick data. But I actually believe that we need to do both, right? We need to go backwards and forwards. So if you, you know, are doing some kind of an ethnography or you have interviews and you have insights, then look at the big data and use, you know, I guess that comes back to your question actually. Maybe this makes you look at the wrong variables in your model. But I think, you know, through looking at both at the same time, you, you can maybe get insight, right, from that. So yeah, very good observation. Any other question? Yeah? So I, I've heard uh, some people say that uh, the focus on mining software repositories has done little except to divert software engineering researchers from looking at the things they should be looking at. That in fact, the papers, though they're scientifically defensible, are nonetheless trivial and a distraction from actually thinking about hard problems. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion? I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can save it for dinner if you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, think, I, I think there's, so, I, I agree to a certain extent. I mean, you, you can see examples of this everywhere, right? You know, that as researchers we get sucked into working on something that maybe isn't actionable or maybe is the wrong thing, right? You know, I, I definitely think part of the issue with the mining software repositories work is that the data is just too darn easy to access, yeah. Yeah. you know? And you can have a, you know, a first year graduate student, you know, basically they have a little bit of statistics knowledge or they know how to use Weka or something and they just go and they, you know, throw themselves at that data. And meanwhile, they're not even thinking about some of the bigger problems, right? Which was why I had that risk of, you know, Big data can maybe distract you from the big questions, you know, the harder questions. Um, but at the same time, maybe, you know, maybe, okay, maybe we didn't all use our time as well as we could have doing that work. I mean, but perhaps some of what they've done will show benefit in the future because I do, I do firmly believe that it is the use of algorithms and big data that are going to make major breakthroughs, right? And we're seeing this in medicine, right? You know, they say that the cure for cancer or some kinds of cancer is going to come from big data and algorithms. Um, and I think in software engineering, we're a long way from that, actually. I'm not sure that I see, I don't know if Jim agrees with that as well, but I don't see that it's brought any major kind of breakthroughs, but hopefully it will. And we'll talk about it more at dinner. <laughs> any other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. This was really interesting. Thank you. So you mentioned um, several different platforms, right? And they're often used kind of concurrently or together. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the role of multiplicity in this discussion and kind of um, how that is or is not captured in either thick or can you can you just uh, define for me what you mean by multiplicity? Just well, sure. So I mean, people. You mentioned Slack. You guys yeah. are studying Slack, and so that's not the only platform that a dev team is using, right? right. So um, if you're mining Slack, you know, 
how can that, how do you see that, um, the analysis or interpretation right. existing within kind of an ecosystem of these data traces? Right. It's a very good question. And, and actually, we've been doing that, right? So we've been looking at uh, the most popular tool, right? You know, Twitter, right? Twitter is just one microblogging tool. Actually, we also <coughs> did a study uh, looking at an internal microblogging tool. And we looked at GitHub, right? Because developers are using GitHub right now, and we're looking at Slack. Um, I think it's important that when you look at any of these tools that you try to sort of find out what are the properties about these tools and then look at do these actually, the findings that you get, do they actually hold when you do studies of other tools. Um, and we've been trying to do that a little bit. We've looked at Bitbucket and when we did the Twitter study, you know, we, we did think about using other microblogging tools, but there is something about, there is a property of a tool that occurs when everybody's using it, right? So Stack Overflow, for example, has certain features of gamification in it, right? Um, but there is no other alternative in terms of where you have so much, the, the sort of network effect of having so many people using it. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a really hard thing to study because one of the things that we found from our survey is that on average, developers are using 12 of these different tools. And that's, only, I mean, maybe they got tired clicking, <laughs> you know. Actually, 25% of them were using over 14, and some were using as many as 21, right? Um, and then, you know, but presumably they're using even more of these tools. And some of the findings that we uh, got from that survey, and I have a link to it, um, is that the developers that are using them are facing huge challenges. And uh, when, when I asked about multiplicity, I wasn't sure if you talked about sort of ethnicity or different cultures. Uh, the challenges that are, that are coming out from people who don't speak English using all of these tools is huge, right? So many, many issues come out. Um, culture comes out, even people who speak English, right? Different ways of communicating. And these tools are, you know, if they're not used in the right way, they pose barriers, right? So David Bradnaz is doing a lot of work on that, on, on red mo um, barriers, right, to developers joining these communities. So there's lots of these different issues come out. But what's interesting is that as you're studying it, it's just it's changing underneath us, right? You know, it's like being in quicksand almost. I don't know if that answered your question very well, but thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, I have a different kind of question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from your talk, I um, deduce that uh, you are, um, I would say, um, talking about the people that use these tools and these developers as if they were the world. And yes. I mean, what happens with yes. all the developers that, that are not allowed to that yes. because the company doesn't allow them to? Yes, excellent and there point. are. Yeah, excellent point. So Scott Hanselman actually refers to some of these developers as dark matter developers, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> really, really good point. So, I mean, a lot of, there are a whole host of developers uh, using, not using these tools, right? So still developing in the traditional way, right? The way that I learned how to develop, right? I learned an API from reading a book, from cover to cover. That's how I learned an API and I learned how to code. Um, and there, there are millions of developers that are doing that. Um, and yeah, that, that's a completely different thing, but, but. Yeah, but they are also th developers. They are, they are there. They are also developers, but I'm, uh, again, I'm being recorded. <laughs> Um, are they the developers of tomorrow, right? Why so, not? Well, if, uh, if you think about the way that our kids are learning today at school, they learn through using tools like Facebook, and they learn through connecting with other people and using Wikipedia, and... Well, many schools are going back to the uh, old system because they discovered that it's not so good yeah, why, yeah. because they don't write, actually write. Oh yes, and, and that's a major problem, right? That so writing and so reading is really, I'm not really, really important. sure yeah. which is yeah, better. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. It's a very good question. In our survey, we tried to reach what we call these dark matter developers. We couldn't reach them because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't using the tools that we were recruiting from. Yeah. Um, and I sent it to colleagues at, I won't say the, the name of the companies, but I sent it to colleagues that I had at large companies asking them to uh, you know, give my survey to other developers in their companies. And they retweeted it for me. And I'm like, no, I don't want you to retweet because <laughs> the developers I want, the, I want to answer this survey are not using Twitter or they're not using GitHub, right? They're already this special class of developer. So yeah, in our paper we actually do talk about that and we say that our population is this social population, right? Uh, very good question. All right, I'm, I'm going to call yeah. a halt to the questions now.
please feel to join us downstairs for the uh, reception. Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Storch.